Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, the University of Westminster, Westminster Business School, and today's webinar uh, panel discussion on the question of elite versus grassroots, uh, which is more important to sport. So this course is a, this course, the Sports Management BA, is the course that's being looked at today, and we're joined by uh, two of the academics, um, including the course leader. Um, who lecture on the program, as well as um, uh, Dr. Andy Pitchford, who's our director of SETI here at the University of Westminster. So um, it's a very uh, interactive session. So we're going to have an audience poll at the end of the session on this question. Um, and yeah, feel free to send your questions through in the Q&A box. And yeah, so without further ado, I'll hand over to the panel. Thanks very much, Joe. And uh, yeah, thank you to everyone for, for joining us. Um, we just want to take you through a little bit of a journey of what uh, sports management is, is about here at the University of Westminster, um, but also give you a little bit of insight about kind of what drives us and why, why we love sport at, at both ends of the spectrum of sport. So, you know, for, for me, I, I've played sport and I, and I still do as well, albeit not as well as I used to when I was a little bit younger. Um, I've coached sport and now kind of I'm in a position where I get to teach about the world of sport. Um, and I love it across all levels. I'm a fan of sport first and foremost, uh, but a lot of my passion is at community level and grassroots level of sport um, and what I find most fascinating is that um, sport is in the eye line of so many people um, and it's more and more accessible as a genuine career path for people and for students that get to start their sports journey with us and, and courses like this um, yeah, that is the start of a, of a wonderful career in, in the world of sports management and sports business and that's where a lot of my passions for sport come from and um, with us here today as well we have um, my colleague Richard Weston perhaps better tell you but his passion for sport is Richard himself. Hello there uh, yes my name's Richard West um, I, I was responsible for bringing this course together um, oh, a couple of years ago now um, my, my background is that um, I went to university and played uh, both football and, and rugby quite a few years ago now. Um, so the, the, the sports that I tend to, um, you know, sort of participate in more uh, tend to be the more, you know, sort of recreational ones that we win Olympic medals at. Um, in other words, you know, sort of golf and rowing and things. Um, yeah, I'd just like to uh, emphasize what, um, uh, what, what Anise was saying, that I think uh, more and more uh, sport is just... Uh, a fantastic opportunity, a fantastic uh, career um, pathway. And uh, I, I, I hope that uh, as a result of this, you're going to um, maybe consider, consider taking the, taking the programme. At least, I don't know whether we want to introduce Andy, do we? Absolutely, absolutely please, yeah. I'll go on. <laughs> okay, Elise, can you see me all right? I'm not. I'm not sure if you can. You can see. Yes, you, yes, you know, can see nice right. clearly. Hi, hi, everybody. My name's Andy Pitchford. So, um, I've been at the University of Westminster for nearly a year now, and I've worked at lots of different universities. Always in the well, until now, actually, always in the sport realm. And I'm uh, an occasional contributor to the course on the basis that I've been researching um, elite and grassroots sport for 25 years. I've been teaching in this space for 30 years, but I've also had some um, quite unusual experiences in sports. So um, I was the chairman of a professional club for three years. I've been on the board of different um, sports agencies um, over the years as well. So I feel like I've, I've seen it, uh, I've seen sport at lots of different levels, um, including the like whatever the very base fundamental level is, because I've now just started a career in. Uh, recreational paddle. I don't know if anybody's tried paddle. It's a cross between tennis and squash, really. It's, it's tennis or an enclosed sport. Um, and I feel uh, enlivened by that. I really love it. But I also feel totally useless. I'm on a beginner's course and, and, I, and I'm at the bottom of the beginner's course. It's quite, in a way, quite refreshing to be in that situation again and learning from the start again. So, yeah, I've got a sort of lifetime of um, involvement with sport. I really love it. And I think the most exciting thing that I've experienced with with courses like this is seeing the fabulous careers that um, students go on to and it's always a source of great pleasure to see them go into 
sometimes you know local government sometimes professional sports clubs sometimes major agencies sometimes big commercial operators um but i know that that most if not all of them have a really wonderful time in the sector so yeah I, i'd urge you to consider this seriously and to think about what might be a good foundation for you um coming into this this area thanks very much andy and it's really nice that um andy touched upon there all these different fields and, and, and careers that you could have just by doing a course like this um, and, and to kind of start off we want to give you an overview of the sorts of things that you would be studying here across the three years of university so kind of in this pale orange um, you have the core modules that we have so you know through the years these are the, the modules that you will be doing um, and then you also have optional modules that you can choose so in your first year of, um, of the course you, you, you can essentially choose any module that is available to uh, supplement your year's program and um, our current cohort of first years are going on to do social media modules, setting up your own business modules, um, entrepreneurship. So there, there is a whole range of, of modules there. But I mean, at the core of it, we want you to understand the business of sport um, and how to set up and run an event. So the management of sport, um, we touch upon accounting and finance as well and innovations in marketing. And perhaps I can just come to, to Richard there. That's a module uh, you've just run, the innovative marketing one. So, so what exactly is that, Richard? And, and what could students expect by doing that module? Well, what we do in that module is basically teach an introduction to um, sports uh, sports marketing. Um, so we take you through um, from quite a uh, quite a you know sort of basic level. We don't assume that you have any uh, you know particular knowledge of marketing, and um, through um, various um, uh, activities, uh, which involves studying a, a, a basketball club in Brent. Um, uh, writing you know, marketing plans and 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 other other forms of other forms of assessment, so it's it, it's a really good um, foundation foundation in in uh, sports management sports marketing. Fantastic, thanks, Richard. Um, and you know the, the journey that you go on is obviously we, we're getting you career ready as well. That's the idea. So uh, the module that I lead on is employability and sport event management. Um, our students were. Uh, doing interviews, they were preparing job applications, uh, updating or creating LinkedIn profiles to create an online presence about themselves. So really from the first steps that you join in, in, in this first year, we want to give you the fundamentals and foundations of sport and give you what you would require over a three year period or four year period if you choose to do a placement year where you will end up what is the ideal sports management student looking like and and what jobs can they go out into and that's really where the importance of these um, optional modules come because you start to set your own pathway you know uh, we continue with accounting and finance with the economics and finance of sport and you can see that journey through each of these levels but by the time you get to your third year, you might have a particular interest in an area of sport that you want to work into. So that could be uh, one of the choices that you make when it chooses it comes to choosing your optional modules. And as much as myself and Richard, when we're teaching the course, uh, we love teaching. You know, we, 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 can, we can talk forever, <laughs> um, but we are conscious that students will sometimes get bored of hearing our voices being repeated week on week. So one of the ways in which we try to engage students through the course is getting some wonderful guests to come and join us. And already this uh, first semester that we've just had uh, with our first year, uh, we've had the head of global communications from the WTA, that's Alex Pryor, uh, come in and speak to our students and also set one of the assignments that the students had to do for part of their coursework. Uh, Johan Lacroix, who uh, heads up the broadcast and rights management for the IOC, um, joined us straight after the Tokyo Olympics, had a little bit of a quiet spell before started concentrating on the Beijing Winter Olympics that's upcoming. Um, so he joined us as well to talk to our students. Uh, we had Melanie Mortensen, who works for a Danish sports agency, works with some of the largest and biggest uh, Danish sports stars across the world, who joined us to talk a little bit about her work. And Joseph Oakshot, who, who took his work global, he started work um, with the FA, had an interesting interaction uh, with him. I met him once when I was a tour guide at Wembley Stadium, uh, my, one of my first ever jobs coming out of university. Um, um, and what we tried to teach people through, through that particular session when Joseph came in was the importance of your networks. Um, I spoke and met Joseph once and that network stuck for over 10 years, a relationship 
came from that. Um, and he went from working at the FA um, to working at some of the largest sports events around the world and now working in international media management with one of the most famous football clubs in world football. So some really interesting guests that we try to, to come and join us. And we've got a whole set of uh, other guests that are joining us um, for semester two as well. And that's just a taste of some of the things that you could sample through joining uh, the course. But as well as the course content, we've also got the things that really um, interest us essentially in, um, in, in sports. And, and one of the stories that I think me and Richard debated quite extensively was the BBC Sports Personality of the Year. Um, and whether this award is given on the basis of success in your sport or being a personality that can have a positive impact on the wider audience that views sport. So here you see some of the biggest names um, in sport from this year. Um, what I quite like about this um, showcase of some of those that were shortlisted for it, it's quite a diverse background of individuals and, and, and a mixture of sports that are involved. Some are more recognizable than others. Um, but Richard, I think I had an issue with the eventual winner of, of the award. And the eventual winner of the award was Emma Raducanu, who, Again, let's let's not um, you know, downplay her achievements. Phenomenal achievement um, for for British tennis um, and her success in the U.S. Open, which came after a fantastic run in Wimbledon. But was she the personality of the year? That's the question that I'm kind of putting to the audience, but also putting to you, Richard. What do you think, Richard? You muted. I'm, I'm going to go against that actually because I, I, I voted for Matt Carney. That's um, <laughs> <laughs> because I think I think what she achieved was you know was spectacular, and um, and and and, it, and it's never been done before. What was it the you know sort of first time in in however many years um, that um, a, a, almost a grassroots play has has come through to 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 triumph in a in a major, major championship. So I, 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 think, I think that it was deserved. I'm not going to say it wasn't deserved, Richard. I'm not going to say it wasn't deserved. I think you could argue for a case for any of those that were shortlisted. I just yeah. look at the other three faces that are on this screen here, and I just think there was a far greater representation beyond their sporting success for what they did for the wider community that watches their sport. So there's, you know, there's the, the LGBT community that may not have much interest in sport or diving in particular, but the impact that Tom Daly has in his field and his sport galvanizes a community. What Raheem Sterling has done for certain social groups in London, um, the disability or um, success that's been showcased through the Paralympics. You know, what did Emma Raducanu do for tennis and for women perhaps and girls? Were, were they inspired by her story? I just don't know. Maybe in some years to come, but I would say that there was an argument that these other three people on the screen were greater personalities than perhaps Emma Raducanu, but that depends on what the award's for. Perhaps we can bring in Andy. What's Andy's thoughts on this? Uh, I have to say I'm with Richard because I, <laughs> I, 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 I take everything you've said about the potential impact of those other personalities, and I think they're, they're all really wonderful and incredible but um i, I just think as a, as a, as to, to achieve what uh she did at that tender age i think you, you might find that you know if you reviewed her career later on she might be able to account for some of the things that you're describing um now but i think that 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 moment of excellence was so extreme and so and such an achievement it'd be hard it's hard not to recognize that but i think this is the kind of thinking that we encourage on degrees, you know, uh, extent to which things that we accept on a day-to-day -day basis, are they, are they right? Could they be unpacked? Could we think about them in a different way? Um, so I think that your challenge to uh, this process is a really good one. And it's the kind of thing we'd, we really like to encourage our students to do as well, isn't it? Fantastic. I'm beginning to find Andy's going to be a happy medium between myself and Richard. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, you know, th these were the people that were shortlisted, but I think, Richard, when we discussed the, or we extensively debated this bit prior to this um, this uh, presentation, we also kind of mentioned some people that didn't get shortlisted and, and missed out. And I, again, based on what Andy said, it's not to downplay what, what Emma managed to achieve in, in tennis, um, but it's also recognising that these individuals aren't just in their sport 
for themselves perhaps to win, but actually the impact that they can have on a wider audience um, and the role that they play in society is, is so pivotal. So you know, Richard, why, why did we pick out these three in particular? Well, I think Marcus Rashford there, uh, you know, because um, because what 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 he's done, um, and and you know, sort of prompted politicians to really, um, you know, sort of really think again about uh, about you know, sort of the fairness of what they uh, of what they do. Um, uh, Lewis Hamilton, um, yeah, I, I think you know he's on record as saying that, um, you know, his his greatest triumph or all his wins and everything, but his greatest triumph was actually you know sort of representing the black community. And um, Sky Brown, yeah, uh, Sky Brown, yeah, um, horrific injury earlier earlier in the year, and yet she's you know she's fought back. Uh, she's fought back and is as as challenging, uh, challenging our, our 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 conceptions, if you like, of 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 age and achievement. Yeah, absolutely, Richard. So yeah, three fantastic sports people. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a whole host of more sports people <laughs> that we think would would be worth consideration. But these three in particular uh, stood out for us. And and again, and again, it comes back to the point is that when when we look at sport, you know, we try to encourage our current students to. You know, have a session with us on a Monday and Tuesday and we start the session by saying okay what's your sports story from the weekend or if we have a midweek session what's your sports story of the week and at the start of semester we'll, our students would start by you know telling us the football scores or you know the competition results from their particular favorite sports and as the weeks went on what we started getting was students talking about you know, impactful stories that have um, happened in sport that necessarily move us away from being sports fans, but having a mindset of understanding the management of sport and the business of sport and how individuals within sport can influence that. And those three examples all sit in, in the world of elite sport. And, and, and Richard, you're going to tell us a little bit about uh, elite sport and the elite sports pyramid or whether it still applies. Yeah, yeah. Interesting one. Interesting. Um, have, have we got the poll set up? Joe? We do, yes. Let's let's just put this to the test then, shall we? Can we um, can we um, set up a poll to see who considers themselves to be an elite athlete? You're on mute. Yeah, Richard, I'm I'm not sure I understand the question. Did you want to run the existing poll or did you? Oh, oh no, no, it's, it, it's okay. It, it's okay there, but. Um, can, what have we got in the chat? Um, oh, can't spell. <laughs> so the question is Richards are asking so who consider them considers themselves an elite athlete so I wonder is there anyone in our audience that considers themselves an elite athlete nobody yet oh well Maybe they're all shy. Got uh, eight participants. No. All right, let's let's carry on. Um, it's, quite, it's quite a tough question. I, I I I I'm not sure how easy it would be to come forward. So so my 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 tiddlywinks capability, I might consider to to be in that category, but um. A question I'll ask in a little while is which sports deserve to be seen as elite, which is why I raised the question. But anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, good, good point, good point. Well, I mean, when we talk about elite sport, it, what we're really referring to is high-performance sport, um, where the emphasis is on winning prestigious um, competitions and distinguishes it really from uh, mass sport or recreational sport. 
uh, where the emphasis is on, a, on attracting the maximum number of competitors. But it remains the you know, sort of question, what do we actually mean by elite? Um, because you know, sort of fewer than one in five people actually participate in sport more than three times a week. And really, you know, so when we talk about elite, elite sport, uh, do we mean, you know, sort of academic? Do we mean national, international competitors, medal winners, Olympic professionals or semi-professionals? And also there's this idea that, you know, sort of for, 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 for um, the elite sport pyramid to work, you need to have a, a big base, a big base to produce those top performance, top performers. And I would argue that um, that's not necessarily, you know, sort of the case. Um, and I think, you know, sort of wherever possible, when we're talking about elite sport, uh, it's to try and prioritise, you know, sort of the performance data over variables such as international or professional status, or in the absence of uh, quantitative performance, um, prioritise competitive experience and success in highly competitive leagues over international representation. So I think, you know, sort of when we talk about elite sport, it's really opening a can of worms. Yeah, it's really interesting there, Richard, because I, I was very tempted to answer the question in the chat myself, because um, as I mentioned earlier, I still try to play sport, and it's certainly not at an elite level, of course. I'm kind of in this sports club local competition region, um, but playing Sunday league football, um, maybe 12 years ago, 15 years ago, um, I was young, right? I was quicker and stronger than a lot of people and fitter. Um, but as I've got older, I realized that to still compete, even at that local level, perhaps I needed to have some sort of elite mindset in that I need to get myself fitter to be able to compete at this level. And when we play at that level, that's, that's our Wembley, right? That's our Anfield depending on which team you support. But you know, Richard, we spoke about tennis and you, know, you can go for a hit with someone leisurely. But if, uh, if me and you, Richard, were to have this game of tennis that we've been promising for so long, we would play games and sets and have an eventual winner, right? Wouldn't we? we would. So there is that element of competition that comes in, um, which it, it, it's odd, but it creates an elite mindset it, it, from that alone. I wonder what Andy's thoughts are here. I'm interested in uh, it's the, the, the perspective that you brought to play in this is really interesting, but, but I suppose in a related way, I'm interested in the experiences that athletes have in different sports. So I don't think any of us would argue that, you know, we, we all know that um, Premier League, we would describe as elite sport, you know, professional uh, football players at the, at the top of their competitive level are elite sports people but then um what, what about the equivalent snooker player um would we regard them you know if, they, if they're at the top of their performance tree or their performance pyramid you know are, are they elite in the same way um they, they would have to develop different capabilities to get there wouldn't they different skills but i, I sometimes wonder um whether the same processes apply and, and then you wonder about some um, Olympic sports that um, I'm thinking particularly of some of the horse based um, Olympic sports where actually you know, looking at that um, uh, pyramid, is there even a pyramid in, in, in those sorts of sports? It's such a tiny population of people that's able to engage with that sport at all. It makes me wonder if, if um, some of those elite athletes go through exactly the same processes to get to the to the top. Um, so I think it's a messy concept sometimes and, and sometimes and, and perhaps going towards a sort of attitudinal understanding and thinking about the mindset that people are applying is one way that we might we might draw across those different spectrums, definitely. Okay. Yeah, some really interesting points there. You know, and with this you know, dissecting of uh, elite sport, we we don't well, we touch upon that base that Richard Arsenal does having a, a larger base population to play a sport, um, aid. The, the creation of, of a top performer in that sport and you know as much as I am a sports fan and I and I, and I love elite sport uh, my, my passion comes from community sport um, I like seeing the impact that um, some sort of physical activity can have on an individual and, and a society um, 
and, and there's direct effects and, and indirect effects that can come about from that. And, <laughs> um, I would still consider myself a very early researcher in my, in my career. And, and the idea that um, we can look at sports activities and, and programs that are set up and understand how are they impacting the well-being of individuals and, and communities physically, mentally, socially, psychologically speaking, um, and you know, these benefits, how, how are they supporting this idea that we're trying to create a healthier and, and stronger community from that? And I've been fortunate enough to, to work with some charities that engage in some of these activities with very specific demographics. Um, and I've got three examples of, of them just here with their pictures. So you know, one of them's uh, Fight for Change, who are a boxing charity based in uh, South London. And they use boxing as a tool to um, work with gangs or individuals that were once in gangs and, and come out of prisons. Um, and they've seen that there's an attachment between this identity with gangs and mental health. And what they've done is create a model through boxing to help keep people off the streets and now away from gang culture, but also to alleviate mental health issues that were coming about from this as well. And yet that sort of activity wouldn't work on a completely different demographic, of course. So here we've got Black Prince Trust, uh, the image just to the right of that one here. Um, and they work next door to Fight for Change. They share some of their facilities and, and they're a charity that focuses on many different sports and many different communities. But here are local residents in the uh, council area areas just around where the um, sports facility is and they're focusing on a retired demographic to get more people engaged socializing where they might be staying at home more often and you can see it's a bit of a, an older audience uh, that are attending these sorts of activities and, and, they, and they focus doing midweek activities during the day because they know people have got some free time and it gives them something to do and get out and do stuff um, to be fit uh, and one of the ways in which they do that is walking football um, and what we're getting to here is this idea that different communities can be engaged in different ways. Um, so MSA was a sports group that my, 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 my wife and a few of my family members actually went and attended sports sessions when they first um, opened up. And what they created was a blueprint for how to engage very difficult to engage groups into sport. Um, and I find it fascinating because now this is giving other organizations a platform to be able to create activities, create programs to get people fitter, whether that is physically, maybe it's about social well-being, maybe it's about psychological well-being, and get these direct and indirect benefits out to wider communities. And what we try to do with some of our work through this um, course is help you understand exactly how those organizations run. What is the difference between an organization that is set up to run a, chari a charitable activity like this compared to, say, Chelsea FC, compared to, say, the All England Lawns Tennis Club? Like, these are all businesses registered with companies house or their charities what are the differences how do the objectives change between them they're all involved in sport right but on complete different levels uh, and we try to understand all of that and, and, get, and take that understanding to you as part of your learning Richard what are your thoughts on community sport the, and, and these direct and indirect benefits I think I, th I think they're very worthwhile I think they're very worthwhile and and certainly, you know, sort of uh, our, our students on the program at the moment, I don't think any of them, well, maybe apart from one, uh, could be considered an, uh, an elite athlete. But they're all, uh, they're all very, you know, sort of competent and um, and 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 good good sports people. Fantastic, and perhaps to bring in Andy here because I know Andy's obviously done um, you know, extensive research in 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 these fields. Uh, Andy, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I think it's lovely the connections you've made with uh, Fight for Change. And I know that there's a whole sort of constellation of really amazing social enterprises and charities on our doorstep that are doing this, this kind of work. So I'd hope that students that come along to the programme would, would find ways to engage with these projects because they're really, I think they're really, really um, inspiring. My, my experience of students coming through these um, degrees is that you can shape uh, a, a pathway that suits your interests so if elite sport and, and working with you know big professional clubs or, or elite bodies is, is where you want to be you can shape a program to ensure that you get the right skills and knowledge to do that if your passion is more for participation and that social change um, uh, idea that we've just described then again you can adapt your course and your experiences to make sure that you come out with the, with the right set of, of knowledge and skills. But I, I'm not sure that 
working successfully in those organizations i'm not sure that it's all that different i think i think a lot of those organizations that they, they might want you to have contextual knowledge of their sport or that level but i think really they're looking for creativity they're looking for enthusiasm and passion they're looking for great communication skills and the ability to get on with other people i think it's probably the same set of skills and that's what I think is really refreshing about the program is that you thought those through and in various ways they those core skills really come out through the the choices that students can make and through the the pathways that you put in place um i personally i think there i've, I've seen students get perhaps greater rewards from working in the social change space sometimes the performance sport realm can be a little bit pressurized and a little bit cutthroat because you're dealing with people whose jobs are on the line you know, if, you, if you're not successful, you, you know, you might have a, an elite coach or an elite manager or, or a, a, a coaching community who are threatened by a lack of success. So I think sometimes there's a bit more pressure. Pressures are different, but yeah, that, that would be that would be my, my expectation. There's perhaps a little more pressurized in that um, environment, but then some people really thrive on that and, and enjoy it. But um, I, I think the course is certainly really well set to support you going into whichever realm of sport that you enjoy and that, and, that, and that you think will bring you satisfaction yeah thanks andy and uh yeah thanks richard for that it's it's, it's interesting because even using two of our current students as examples they've just completed their first semester and you know, we've got one that wants to move into working at a sports agency they want to travel the world they want to work away from london they want to get out um, and then we've got another one that wants to stay based in north london to develop their basketball academy that they've just started up here and they feel like the modules that they're doing help them helps give him a skill set from social media accounts management delivering a session project management all of these different avenues and yet two very different fields and they both are enjoying the course in a way where they feel like they can develop and after three years go out into their into their working environments that they, they've got passion for so and it's, i think that's what's really unique about the, the positioning of the course because we're we're right in the center of london so so many of the of uh, sports governing bodies are based in the capital so many major institutions you know even even right around the corner you've got lord's cricket ground you've got really significant professional football clubs you've got major major institutions on the doorstep but then you've also got the most incredible innovative community-based agencies doing the kind of work that you described and having worked at other really significant sport institutions bath being an example we would have we would have done anything for these sorts of opportunities. We really are in a place where, with a little bit of help and support, we can enable uh, students to, to take on incredible experiences in addition to the core learning that they'll do with colleagues on the course. So I think it's a really unique opportunity and one that people probably don't realise it's there because you, you look first at the university and has the university got a stadium or, I'm being silly, but you know, has it got big sports facilities? But actually that's not the key. The key is, the experiences that you can get through the network and the community that you're entering when you come to university. Yeah, absolutely, Andy. Thank you. Thank you for that. So it gives you an idea of the, how the, the worlds of elite sport and, and community sport um, are, are almost different, but also there are elements of them that are quite similar. And there's uh, some, um, some of those are reflected upon by um, our fourth panelist. Oh, I'm not sure if he's quite a panelist, but he was a guest who couldn't join us today, but he was really keen to give um, his insight into um, his involvement in both elite sport and uh, in, in community sport. So uh, Joe is someone that I've known for a long time, Joe Long, who is the director for UFC Gym UK. So yeah, that is a, a franchise gym opportunity that's set up um, sort of using elite sport as a backdrop to you know, promote healthy activity through uh, mixed martial arts. But Joe also at weekends runs uh, one of East London's largest junior football leagues uh, as well. So it's quite a, a, a very different environment to what he's got in the UFC gym set up. Um, and and I, I had the opportunity to speak to him about both of those experiences and what, and what it means to work in both elite sport and perhaps community sport as well. So I'd like to share this video with you. Okay, so Joe Long has Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm here to have a quick interview with uh, Joe Long. And uh, Joe Long has a very, very interesting role in sport. He sits as the UFC gym director, 
but also as the ELE League chairman. That's where our acquaintance goes back, Joe, from uh, youth teams that I had in your uh, grassroots football league in East London. But really interesting that you've got a role to play with uh, one of the most innovative and rising brands in the world of sport, that is the UFC. So, uh, Joe, tell us a little bit about your involvement. How are you involved in elite sport and grassroots sports and uh, how did you get there? Okay, so thanks for having me on, Anise, uh, and and uh, it's it's great to be with you. Uh, yeah, so 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 my my involvement started uh, with sports, working in sport from previously competing in sport. So so I I, I initially uh, done martial arts from a very young age, and then I went on to compete internationally. And with a lot of people in, in, in sport, you know, whether it's uh, sports development or, or elite sport or, or sports promotion, sports management, a, a lot of people have come from competing. And uh, my passion was from competing in karate. I competed internationally uh, and unfortunately had to stop uh, uh, sooner than I wanted. Uh, so I, I stopped competing internationally when I was 22. And uh, I always knew I still wanted to remain in sport. Uh, specifically within the sport, you know, within karate, within the sport which I, which I'd grown up with and, and competed in, uh, I couldn't do that on, on an international level anymore because of my injuries, and and I, and I chose to to stop competing because of them injuries. Uh, so my my passion for the sport led me into starting to get involved with events, uh, and that's really where 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 it all started from. Uh, you know, was that passion and wanting to remain involved with with my sport brilliant so there's 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 almost an elite mindset there from very early on in your career the fact that you were competing internationally how does that elite mindset help you with the grassroots football league that you're also chairman and running um well the the youth league which we set up we we, we actually set up the youth league well, I, I set set up the youth league. I'm sounding old now in these. When when I was, uh, I think this no next year is 25 years. So next year's 25 years of uh, both the combat sports promotions which we've done, which has led to me becoming yeah, director of UFC Gym in in the UK and partner with UFC Gym, uh, and also when we started the football league. So it's 25 years. So I, I was around 23 when I started my own events, 22, 23, uh, with, with the youth league, you know, we started it because I, myself and a uh, former footballer uh, who played for QPR back in the day, a gentleman called Peter Hucker, see that there, there was a hole with, with, with youth football uh, in terms of people not being able to, to make it to away games. So Pete, Peter Hucker had a um, a youth football club in Wanstead in East London, and he didn't he couldn't get his kids in in his club to compete in certain leagues because he didn't have the support with the parents to take them to games which was maybe forty forty five minutes away, you know, unless he was hiring a minibus every every weekend. So so the idea was to create a a, a youth league uh, local where people could come to the same venue each week. Uh, I suppose the mindset, going to what you said, the mindset is more about the, the crossover from be, being being a competitive athlete to, to, to working in business is really discipline uh, uh, and understanding where you're going. So, you know, you know, let's take, for example, if, if you're competing within combat sports, you know, you've got a, a competition coming up in three or four months time and you know that you need to do A, B and C. To, to get into to your you know optimum shape and and be match fit and ready for, for that date. The same applies. The, the same applies to running an event, you know, or opening a gym. It, it, it's a time scale and the discipline to get to that point. So it seems like you've had a very dedicated career, and especially with uh, what you could call it a setback, but it's almost been an opportunity where you came away from competing to have an entrepreneurial vision to, to solve a problem that you know grassroots football league had how have you been able to um develop these ideas and your own professional competencies to eventually lead to being connected to one of the world's biggest sports brands in, in the ufc and, and the gyms that you're now directing uh i, I would say that it's it, it's trust trust 
honesty uh, and openness and and results. You know, you, you don't you don't get you don't without them you don't you don't really get nowhere. I mean, it's it's easy. You know, there's a saying: numbers don't lie, and it, it's it's very true. You know, I think I think I'm going to sound younger now. Jay Z said in the <laughs> song, uh, so hopefully I'll, I I can appeal to the students there. Uh, but it's very true. You know, num numbers don't lie. You know, so so if you're not getting results, especially now, you know, with you know software. KPIs, so on and so forth. If you're not get hitting results, you know, it's very clear that you're not performing. So, uh, you know, luckily, as I say luckily, you know, with hard work, determination and results over the last 25 years, I've been able to work myself into a position of trust within combat sports globally to, to be able to put to, together a deal with you know, the UFC gym and, and the UK team and uh, have create a great team of people around me to, to, to roll that brand out in the UK. Fantastic. I mean, you're talking about results and, you know, clearly over, over the years you've, you've kind of hit some amazing targets. But what about challenges that you face? What's the kind of biggest hurdles that you've had to overcome to get where you are today? Uh, I think we have, with sports promotions, uh, if, if, if you look at events, you know sports events sports promotion sports management you know even management of athletes you know i think it's very important to stay focused on on, on the job at hand so you know you don't get pulled in the direction of gossip and noise you know you you you, you know the, the same as if you you know you're doing a whatever whatever job you're doing that your 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 atten attention isn't distracted by the, the the periphery noise around that industry, uh, and and if you believe in something that that you uh, you do whatever it takes to get to get to that point, you know you don't you if you personally believe in something and you want to make it happen, that then you know that that's that's your direction, right? Don't 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 come off of that road, you know, keep keep going down that road. That's brilliant. And yeah, I think you've kind of answered my final question there, is, and that would have been what advice have you got for our potential students that are currently looking to, well, they're deciding if they want to do a sports management course with us at the University of Westminster. Um, let's say something else. What is your other piece of advice that you'd have for them other than that kind of clear focus and direction and following your dreams and passions? Uh, I, I think it would be persistency. You know, uh, not everything's going to happen overnight. You know, we we have launched ufc gym uk in, in in november of 2019 we opened the fir first store we got closed down in march 2020 because of covid you know it's it's not an easy ride you know in fact it's it's been a real tough ride but you know we're not rolling up in a ball and and going anywhere we, we you know we're sticking to the task at hand and it may take a few years longer than we anticipated but the, the 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 journey is just as exciting as, as you know as the medal. You know, like you, you talk to you know elite sports people. You know, the, the, their training is just as just as exciting as you know as, as that win. You know, and and, and it, it makes that win the win, if you like. So uh, for, for me, my, my advice would be persistency. Uh, you know, you have to, you have to make decisions sometimes that if you know I, I'm doing this and, and I'm not getting anywhere, you know, you know that uh, you know I'm sure everyone's done something you know along them lines, you know whether it's a relationship, you know a business, uh, you know trying trying something new where you, where you start to do it and you you want it to work but you you actually get to a dead end and it's like well this isn't working, you know you've got to use your common sense is very important, <laughs> you know you know you, you know if you're you know Get, get to a point and it's like well this isn't working I need to make a decision and uh, and step back from this so uh, there's a couple of things persistency common sense and not to be too hard on yourself because you know you, you can't take everything in uh, you know in, in the sports world you know whether that's promotions events management personal you know, you, fantastic uh, you, you, you've got to have a have a a thick skin and know that you know you take the emotion out of it i couldn't agree there more and uh yeah it's uh it's, it's amazing that how our, our career trajectory is obviously very very different in the world of sport but 
you know, those are some soft skills that you've mentioned there that I've been able to pick up from you know, my education, academic background that's lead, led me to this position. All my dream dreams were around being involved in sport. Um, and we're involved in sports in very, very different ways. But it's nice for our potential students to hear that actually these skills that you can develop by joining a program like this, it's it's less about the knowledge. You're going to get that knowledge anyway through your experiences, but being able to work on yourself as an individual, reflecting upon that, analysing and you know, carrying those positive aspects forward and those developmental skills that you want to carry on working on um, is, is a key message for any prospective student joining us. And that's what we look to do with that, with our degree here. And, you know, hopefully, Joe, uh, we get to invite you to speak to the same students that are thinking about applying once they've already joined us. And uh, perhaps a little guest session uh, from yourself would, would be awesome. But thank you so much, Joe, for, for your time and, and joining us. Um, it's been excellent for me to hear from you as well. So hopefully it's been the same sort of experience for, for our potential applicants as well. No problems, and easy. It's great to talk to you, and thanks for having me on. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to. You know, when when the students do join up, I'd, you know, I'd love to come down and uh, and meet them and have a chat. I've done some other stuff in Loughborough, uh, Loughborough University, uh, last year, and uh, it went went down quite well. So yeah, love to. Brilliant. The world of elite sport and grassroots sports collides once again, and uh, this debate continues on. Thank you so much, Joe. Lovely stuff. And uh, yeah, I feel like I was nodding along with Joe actually feeling like he was present here um, for that video. And just to kind of touch upon those transferable skills and soft skills that I mentioned, like whilst I was, I mean, I was engrossed again by what Joe was saying about the UFC and, 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 his, and his junior football league, but you know, he mentioned something about kind of results and KPIs and, and that fits into both elite and community sport. I, I used to work for a sports charity um, that uh, had to merge with another charity because the charity wasn't meeting targets, right? So it became a very results-driven environment. Um, we had deadlines to meet. And if we think about being a student, it's quite a similar sort of concept, this idea of the working world, meaning you have to work with other people. Maybe you're left to your own devices a little bit and you're, you're pushed to meet results. Um, and this idea of being focused at the job at hand, not getting too distracted, you could take out the context of UFC, you could take out the context of you know, community sport altogether and just talk about it from the perspective of being a student on this sports management degree, and it would completely make sense. Um, and, and the idea of the demographic of students that we have, we have students that have come straight from school, straight from college, as young 18 year olds that are joining us, but we've also got mature students that have decided, you know what, I've got a passion for sports. I want to change what I'm doing. I, I, I want to get into sports and this is the way to do it. And, and hopefully in some way that resonates with, with those of you that are in uh, the audience. Some of the ways in which the world of sports resonates with, with us are through, through some of our favorite stories of sport from sports over the last year. Uh, so I'll pass over to Richard. And the, these are some of the stories that uh, you picked out here, Richard, hadn't you? Yeah, Richard, you muted. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just just a couple that I thought, um, you know, sort of really uh, warranted um, um, a bit of uh, a bit of comment. Uh, one was Katie Sa uh, Sadlier, who moved from um, rugby um, to um, the Commonwealth Games. And the other was Lewis Hamilton. And the reason that we picked these two um, examples is that they are both um, very good examples of uh, what we call EDI equality, diversity and inclusion. And, and it's really um, highlighting that the opportunity to, you know, sort of move across disciplines and to promote ideas that are not necessarily um, ne necessarily the ones that you would associate with uh, these, these particular athletes um, are, are, are increasingly important. So that, that that was the that was the point I wanted to make. Yeah, it's the two great stories there on on on, on, on EDI, and, and it really is amazing to see the impact that sport can have um, you know, on, on the world. But also, there's you know there's topical issues that uh, sport can bring to life that makes it even more important for individuals. So the, the story that I found quite interesting last year was uh, the story in tennis where uh, <coughs> Peng Shui, the um, women's tennis uh, player who essentially went missing. 
Um, but there's a dispute. There was a dispute from the governing bodies of tennis about how to deal with this situation because uh, the WTA, uh, who I mentioned a little bit earlier on, um, they suspended tournaments in China because of this issue. However, the ITF, the International Tennis Federation, uh, did not want to suspend these tournaments. And whilst these are issues of, um, you know, it was about kind of women's safety and welfare it was kind of the rhetoric that was coming out a lot of it but there was a political issue involved as well um, but then you also have the political issue within sport about how disputes between two governing bodies in in the same sport are, are, are coming up with different solutions to the same problem now that's almost one of the the beauties of sport and, and a sports management program that we can set the same assessment but yet what we mark are different solutions to the same problem that's been presented and that's one of my favorite things as uh, as a tutor as a lecturer and you know a lot of academics will complain about marking but for some reason i rather enjoy it richard simply because we get so many different creative innovative solutions to problems that uh, are presented and you know, that, that is really a, one, one of the best reasons I have for being in my position um, and the other story that I wanted to focus on it comes out of elite sport uh, Simone Ball is one of the uh, most decorated athletes in gymnastics um, who didn't have a fantastic time at the Tokyo Olympic Games um, pulled out of the team final now imagine you're in that team uh, and you you have one of the most um, celebrated gymnasts on on your team um, and you're looking likely to, to head to gold medal and, and before the final, your, your star uh, gymnast pulls out uh, and one of your stars pulls out of the final. Now, as a team, you feel let down, but actually the support that came out from the team and from the wider community that this individual pulled out of, of a major event where she's chasing gold medals that she's trained all her life for because she wanted to focus on her mental health. And, and this is, again, another space that sports, sport has had a positive impact on. Now, we're not here to sit and say sport has got it absolutely right. There's places in the media, places in elite sport, places in community sport that don't quite have it right yet. But the idea is that you have an opportunity to learn about it and perhaps have an influence on the answers that sports presents later on. It, it is one of the best reasons for you to be on a sports management program. And we want to do want to touch on one of the biggest sports events in, in the world, and that is the Olympic Games. And, and with that positive and negative angle that we were talking about just now, there are positive and negatives of absolutely every sporting phenomenon, event, athlete in the world you could talk about. So, um, Richard facility legacy what's the good from the olympic games uh, richard you yeah, yeah i think the good is that it can transform areas like uh, stratford in uh, in uh, north northeast london um, um you know areas that really did need a lot of investment to you know sort of bring them up to up to, up to scratch and also for the long-term use um, intended for sport in London, so I think those are two of the two of the good two, two of the good things. Uh, two two fantastic things, but then also with you know things like the Olympics and facilities, you have the negatives as well. Um, there were some quite scary images of what some of the venues in from Rio twenty sixteen look like today, um, and I think this is the swimming pool arena. That's just left uh, to, to decay and that's not just in brazil that's in other nations as well that's the example that we've got here and something that's been flagged up not just from the olympic games but also from obviously the fifa world cup that's uh, that's coming up at the, the back end of this year um about workers rights in, in the creation of facilities and stadiums and this was something that was flagged up at the beijing games and it's something that continually comes up in in, in nations um with uh, the hosting of, of mega events um, from from a wide variety of sports uh, i wonder if we can get andy on board here what what, what are your thoughts around facility legacy uh, and perhaps ideas perhaps about what london did with uh, facilities well I, I i was drawn to the qatar example actually okay no, please, just, please. Just, just raise it i mean obviously with the workers rights situation and for the first time in my memory You've, you've got athletes who are due to uh, engage with that event who are starting to question the ethical basis of the decision to take it to Qatar in the first place. I, I don't recall such a sort of community or voices um, starting to question things in that way. And I wonder what will happen as a result of that. Um, but also, you have to wonder about the facility legacy for, for, for any uh, use in, in Qatar, unless there's some kind of transformational move for their professional sport. How on earth are those stadia going to be 
um, use. So I think it's a great case study for us coming up to reflect on some of the learning that, that, that you've described from those other events. And it, it's probably at its most sort of extreme example in Qatar as well. So great thing for us to consider and to, for us to reflect on as we as we move forward. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great point there, Andy. It just, I mean, there's, there's obviously a lot of negativity coming around from the Qatar World Cup uh, uh, for a number of reasons. I think just today, Eric Cantona came out and said that he won't be watching the World Cup as, as, a, as part of the boycott that he, that he has towards the reasons why it's gone there. And, and that in itself will galvanise a community and an audience. Perhaps actually, maybe we shouldn't be watching it either. Um, but I did find one of the stadiums really fascinating there. The, there's a stadium that's been built, designed to be taken apart and taken down, where the, um, the outside of the stadium is built by shipping containers. And those same, same shipping containers brought the equipment in to the city to, to build the stadium. And it will be the same shipping containers that are used to ship the, the, the equipment back out and be used to develop facilities, sport facilities across the world. So it, whilst there are a lot of negative story there are some little gleaming lights that come out of every event like we've seen here with the good and the bad from some of the examples that we presented but yeah certainly going to be a very interesting year leading up to the Qatar World Cup and with the Olympic Games a lot is made from legacies um, and the idea of increased participation or perhaps not quite increased so I mean there's a lot of good that comes out from from the Olympic Games you know there's a lot of uh, spotlight placed upon other sports that helps audiences interact with different sports they might not have interacted with in, in such a way um, and also what has also happened in, in in the last few years is we've seen a reduction in the gender gap in participation and actually um, I think the media has, has a fantastic role to play in this because uh, there's been more of a showcase more of a spotlight on on female athletes um, at the elite level but also at a community level um, I've been lucky enough to um, work closely with Saba who sits in the middle here she's she's a, a football coach that works in East London um, but all of these individuals have their own community story uh, within football so the way media has been able to shine a spotlight onto our community champions to galvanize a uh, participation from a particular audience I find very very interesting indeed but Richard you did manage to spot some bad things to come out from participation legacies of the Olympics? Well, I, th I, th I think the bad things to come out is that did it really have that much impact? Um, um, you know, the sedentary lifestyles uh, can uh, continue and so do the missed participation targets. So I think those are some of the, you know, sort of the bad things to, you know, sort of to come out of this. Absolutely, and it's what makes uh, it's what makes the Olympic Games such a fascinating uh, area of study and research, and, and one thing that we like to focus on. But obviously, with the Olympic Games, and certainly when I'm watching it, we're looking out for things like facilities and participation. But wider audiences grow and love certain sports and get into the Olympics, and they don't watch sport much at any yeah. other time of year. And one of the reasons why is because of success, <laughs> right? So, Richard, you you speak a little bit about success. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to put this one in because, um, you know, we, we, we talk about uh, grassroots participation, um, but the fact is that something like about 35% of our uh, GB medal winners um, actually went to private school. And, um, you know, when, when we talk about uh, focusing, um, when, when we talk about focusing on, on particular sports, it's... It, 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 it's a risk because there are other sports like, for example, basketball that really, you know, sort of don't um, don't stand a chance because, you know, we don't we don't um, succeed in the Olympics uh, on the sports like basketball. So it's it's a very, you know, it's a very rational, cold approach. Um, but a British elite sport is certainly booming. And um, who's to who's to argue that it's the it's the wrong approach? Uh, very, very interesting indeed. And you know, we, we've touched upon this argument a little bit earlier on, didn't we, Richard, about the idea of competition and, and, and leisure. So you know, at this point, what, what's our, you know, I wouldn't say a conclusion, but what's our kind of almost a summary of a, where, where are we at with this debate? Well, I, I, I mean, I think, um, I, I think where we are with it is that, you know, the, the, the competition angle that, see, top performance promotes uh, grassroots participation in other words you know the more top performance the more participants that you will get at grassroots level but there isn't actually that much evidence to support that um, 
And remember as well that the successful athletes are not necessarily the ones who perform best in youth competitions. Um, you know, there, there's there's all sorts of other other things. I think and Andy was saying earlier that it's 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 the level and you know sort of skill and competence that um, you 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 will require at at, at certain at certain stages, certain stages in your sporting life. So I think um, I think that's you know those, those those are the two two main things that yeah, I wanted yeah. to I wanted to say. Yeah, that's that's quite a nice summary there. And you know, we we were expecting to meet Andy a little bit later today, so we we were very <laughs> privileged to have Andy come join us a little bit earlier. So yeah, no, thank you, thank you for that, um, Andy. And I suppose. Um, Myself, Richard, we've spoken about this quite a bit, so let's, let's put Andy on the spot here, I think. Um, Andy, what comes to your mind when you see this logo? Oh, you've sprung that on me. I, I don't have any positive things to say. See, I've got loads, I, I've got loads of it. I've got loads of the, the kit in my kit cupboard, but actually, see, when I see, see Nike, I think exploitation, I think manipulation. I've said all the wrong things, haven't I? But that, that's my immediate reaction to that to that logo. No, you haven't actually. <laughs> no, well, this is this is the thing, isn't it? Because it because it raises the questions again about one of the most famous sports brands that we know in the world. So uh, me, me and Richard said, well, well, let's split this into positives and negatives. So if we focus on the positives, because uh, Andy's already put a bit of a dampener on things with Nike at the moment, but we'll come to that. We will come to that. So Richard, you focused on the elite side of Nike. What do you see? What do you think of when you think of Nike? Well, I, I think, you know, sort of certainly the, you know, sort of the risk taking, um, the, you know, sort of the competitive element, uh, the, you know, sort of health benefits that it promotes, and also the, 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 the global community. These are all, you know, sort of very, you know, sort of positive things. Um, you know, there's Rory McGrath there, sorry, Rory McIlroy, and um, uh, I can't see who is, um, but, uh, but these are all the, you know, sort of the positive uh brand attributes if you like of of the of the Nike brand uh but as you said anise following on from that yes exactly uh what also comes to mind with nike and i have to agree richard you know those the, the brands the the feelings of an audience when we associate things with nike um uh, we think of certain athletes, we th think, think of certain words, emotions that are evoked, but Andy's immediate reaction was <laughs> exploitation, no positive words. And actually, if you think about it, these images spring to life. I, I think I did a Google search and typed in like Nike negative or something like that. And the, the images that flash up are quite harrowing. From the world of elite sport, you've got um, superstars. And I mean, global icons of their fields of sport. I grew up knowing that in um, women's athletics, Marion Jones, if she was at the starting block, she is winning her race. And I grew up with Lance Armstrong is in the Tour de France. He is winning that tour and he's winning other cycling events. But yet both years later have been found to have been uh, cheating in their sports through um, the use of performance enhancing drugs. Um, and, you know, that, <laughs> creates an association with uh, the athletes that Nike endorsed. And that's not to say Nike are responsible for the cheating, but the association that is created with these kind of key icons that Nike championed through their careers creates a negative image. And one of the other um, words that comes to mind is certainly something that Andy mentioned was exploitation. So Andy, perhaps you could talk to us a little bit about why that thought comes to your mind when you think of Nike. I think it's just the weight of examples over the last 10 years of Nike managing global processes. So they, they ensure that, that they obviously deliver quality to their consumer. But in order to do that and in order to maintain their profit margins, they perhaps it could be argued do not pay a fair price for the various components of that product, whether it's the labor or the materials or the sourcing. Um, and I think my immediate impression is just is just there have been so many different examples of that um, that it's really infected my consciousness and and that, that is my first response perhaps that's part of being a, you know at a university you, 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 we, we trained to look in the round at subjects and be aware of uh, you know critical um, ideas so so perhaps that's that's I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm a sort of affected by, by, by my environment, but it's definitely the association that comes to mind most quickly for me. Yeah, some very interesting points there, and I, and I have to agree with them. But yet here I sit and 
I put on a pair of Nike football boots to run out and play football in. And you know, it, it's an odd one, isn't it? Because it's not enough to stop me consuming. It's not enough to stop me buying their products. But yet I have a consciousness about this. And you know, these are some of the thought processes that go through some of our students' minds and the challenges that you might, might have to raise. And with the good and bad in sport and that association between uh, a brand and the endorsed athlete, uh, you can also find some connections between sponsorship and, and the good and the bad that can come out of sports sponsorship. Um, so Richard, you, you've got a, you know, a great example of the good of sponsorship. Well, I, yeah, well, I think I think the good, you know, sort of is in, um, is in Wimbledon. Uh, Wimbledon have very few uh, sponsors, but the ones that they do, they build relationships, they build strategic relationships with, and they have a fantastic, um, uh, provide a fantastic platform. So, you know, sort of Robinson's, for example, been, you know, part of Wimbledon since 1935. You know, that, that, that's the kind of uh, focused relationship you want. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were talking about this before and we were saying, you know, if you ever attend Wimbledon and you don't go there because Slazenger and Robinson's are there, but once you're there, those brands make it a special event as well because of the interaction that you have with it. Um, and it is really interesting. However, as much as an event can have some good sponsors, there can be some bad sponsorship packages as well. And, and this from a couple of over the last couple of years is one of the worst that I, that I, I was able to find. And um, the reason for it is because uh, the new cricket concept, the 100, uh, is a really fascinating cricket concept. It's a, it's a shortened version of the game. And we talk about the change of events to widen audiences. Um, and the way that um, we did it in this country for cricket to get younger audiences interested in sport. We've already had 2020, so this was the next uh, big thing to come out. And, and what I really like about it was that the franchise teams that were created had a male and female competition that ran side by side so if you were attending one event you were also attending the other so it was great for you know uh, gender equality but the sponsorship itself was terrible because the um interaction of trying to engage younger audiences means that these this particular sponsorship which is with kp and their associated brands was placing junk food at the front of shirts right in the eye line of the very young audiences that this event is trying to um, interact and engage with okay and you know beyond junk food sports sponsorship on alcohol the betting industry has been in the limelight quite a bit as well uh, tobacco if you you know, roll back the years through you know snooker competitions that used to be heavily sponsored by tobacco and uh, and, and now there's a ban there's no you're not allowed title sponsors from tobacco companies like you were used to in the 70s and 80s anymore um i know france banned alcohol front of shirt sponsorships quite uh maybe over a decade ago now so you know, the world is starting to change its mindset of how we are using um sponsorship engagement and the types of audiences that we're interacting with so as much as there is a financial incentive but beyond the finances of a sponsorship package why are sponsors some sponsors um bad and this is one of the reasons that that we try to talk about through some of our modules and that is our wrap up of, of today you know you've seen the good and the bad of sport you've seen um us fly the flag for community sport you've seen us fly the flag for elite sport you've seen us sit on the fence <laughs> in some of them as well um and, and the, the really the answer back to that kind of title is is very very difficult to comprehend but what we can try and answer is where are you going to end up if you do this particular course um and we use two um quite popular and famous brands in the world of sport Chelsea FC and, and Wimbledon we just mentioned and how you can enter the world of elite and community sport after doing a degree with us so uh, Richard what's the elite examples that we've got here sorry Richard you muted the elite, the, the elite examples that we've got are um things like you know sort of sports events uh getting involved in the organization of of things like Wimbledon um always plenty of plenty of opportunities plenty of um um you know sort of requirements there so those the, 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 those are the um uh, events that i would i would highlight fantastic richard and you know this uh i find it fascinating how an event like wimbledon for will run for two weeks in a year and the number of staff that will be at that event will swell or the organization will swell in size just for two weeks and then it will go back to being a smaller number ready to go again for the next year but what they do have running all year round is the Wimbledon Foundation and they are the charity arm the third sector arm of um, uh, Wimbledon uh, and they will work to 
do some of the activities that we mentioned earlier on from the likes of Fight for Change, Black Prince Trust, the Muslim Sports Association, and, and other many organizations like them where they work for charitable outcomes to provide uh, communities with access to sport and physical activity. Um, and, and Chelsea Foundation is another example of that. It's, it's a separate charity that is connected to the company that is Chelsea FC um, and, and they will work again with charitable objectives and I find it very interesting our Chelsea Foundation in particular um, even though they're based in London the other London based uh, community arms or football clubs tend to operate in their geographical area so QPR tend to focus in their kind of confines around the stadium um, the same with Arsenal, Tottenham, West Ham, Leighton or name them all the London clubs Chelsea have a global mindset for their overall business and the football club that is something that they try to replicate with the Chelsea Foundation so you'll see the Chelsea Foundation go abroad you'll see them go across London you'll see them dip into Surrey so very very interesting how some of the objectives of these organizations can align but have very very different activities and these are all areas that you could potentially work on based on your chosen path after three years here so what should you look for in a course where we've spoken about psychological and social skills from community sports and well-being but this is also something that could help for you when managing three years here at university we're not here to say it's an easy course i don't think any course can turn around and say they are easy there are challenges along the way there are barriers uh, that you will have to overcome but one of the ways in which we try to do that is to make sport feel like your degree, right? You, we, we spoke to Joe and he mentioned some of those soft skills that we say are transferable. And you know, we may be tutors, but maybe we're coaches in this sporting environment that help make you aware of the skills that you have from a very early stage when you come for your first year and how you can develop those skills over three years of your degree. And that's a bit, a bit about our course and why the course, but also why Westminster, we've mentioned that we're connected to industry and professional bodies. We have a large focus on student care. So there's a wide range of support that's available. You have a personal tutor that is given to you from your very first day, and they'll work with you over three years to develop a relationship to make it create a comfortable environment for you uh, to work in. We have a fantastic um, education uh, team as well that is on hand and a careers team that is available to support your progress through University of Westminster. Plenty of opportunities at home and abroad through the connections that we have. Uh, and we are, of course, very proud to be one of the most diverse universities in London. And we work in such a cosmopolitan city. London is such a phenomenal city to learn from different backgrounds, different communities and different sports. So many wonderful sports facilities, hubs and organizations that we have here. And we try to make the most of it all. So elite versus grassroots sports, which is more important? Well, I suppose our thoughts are both. <laughs> after, all, after all of that, I think it's both. I love the fact that I can sit and watch elite sport uh, on a Saturday. I can, you know, I can go to Anfield and watch the best team in the world play. And then I can come to Hackney Marshes on a Sunday and watch one of the worst and love every minute of both of them. <laughs> uh, how about you, Richard? Uh, no, I'd go along with that, except I would say uh, White Art Lane. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Andy, your, your closing thoughts? I, I just think it's a lovely time for people uh, to reflect on the sport they enjoy, the kind of environment they enjoy, and, and realise that a course like this can help you end up with a career in that space. It's down to you, really. The opportunities are there, and the opportunities are certainly on this course. It's, it's really about you taking them and, and making that step forward. Thanks so much. And yeah, thank you, Andy, as well, for joining us um, as well today. And uh, obviously, we open the floor up for any questions that our audience might have. Um, our contact details are available here. If you've got course inquiries, you, you are free to contact that contact address just here. Uh, but Richard and, and myself have our email addresses directly. So if you do have other questions that you might want to contact us about, about the course, things around Westminster, maybe you've got a fun story about sport that you want to want to tell us, by all means, get in touch. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, uh, and if you don't have any questions, I think Joe has a poll to run, perhaps, I think, just ready to launch. Yeah, just to conclude the poll, um, and as we found out from your concluding remarks, it's not necessarily one or the, the other, elite versus grassroots, but <laughs> nonetheless, I'll, I'll run the poll, which is uh, the question of this debate, um, and uh, panellists can take part as well, because I know um, Andy was um, uh, sort of, um, you know, not sitting on the fence, but, you know, torn between the two options. But yeah, so I'll launch the poll now and you've got a minute to vote.
Thanks, Joe. I've, vo I've, I've voted and I'm going to have to disappear at this point. So it's nice to meet everybody. Good luck Thanks. with all your Thanks. decisions. Thanks. Nice to see you, Anise and Richard. See you soon. Thanks very much. Thanks. Indeed. Bye. Okay, it's a unanimous result. 100% um, of participants in the poll have said grassroots. That so is, um, that's interesting. That is wonderful to hear. You won the <laughs> debate. Mm. Yeah, well, I've, I've, I've done my previous institutes. So I joined the University of Westminster um, just at the start of this academic year. My previous institution where I was at, um, I, I still wave the flag of grassroots and community sport, but mm. the students just didn't care about it. They loved that I cared about it, but they themselves didn't care, care as much about learning about you know, the Olympic gold medalists, the different sports bodies that help set up to, to run sport at the elite level. So it's great that we've got people out there that are interested in the world of grassroots sport. Great stuff. Fantastic. Well, I guess it's uh, just a final thank you. A thank you to, to our audience and thank you again to Andy who joined and thank you to Joe as well uh, for setting it up and, and thanks Richard for uh, joining us and, and setting up this wonderful course that I'm, I'm very fortunate enough to be part of and hopefully our students uh, that are going to apply will also be part of it too come September. Hope to see you then. Happy. Take care everyone. Goodbye. Okay.